I am Devidas Agase, visual artist from Mumbai. As we are facing lockdown for 21 days, in this environment, I hope everyone is safe and spending time with their families. The last 10 days we have seen happening around us. I would like to talk about my works that I am doing safely in my studio. Daily, I am working on environment and facets happening around me. In my works, I depicted human as a puppet form. That inspires from our mythology God and Goddesses. We say sometimes God is not in the temple. I want to express my thoughts about the migrated workers. I have a personally attachment with working class because I belong to sugarcane workers family. I feel now the situation we are like a puppet for complete our needs. Reminds me one of my earliest work needs say dance with me. I believe that there are indi uh, silent individuals within an individual who battles for survival. As an artist, I attempt to become a narrative voice of today's silence through my work. In Mumbai, my studio is located in Badlapur. Badlapur is one of a growing town for new construction sites. Here, too many migrated workers from all over Maharashtra and North India surviving with their families. When lockdown announced, they might be scared about their existence, their roji roti or their bread butter. They started to find a way to go back their home. We, we have seen on news. Some people's lines on road. Some people started walking with their children and goods. Some find another ways like a truck, tanker. This time is a horrible situation for workers. Like me, I have saving for at least two to three months. I can survive in this metro city. But question is what about these people? I think we are watching answer on news. I want to finish with one of my all time favorite Marathi poem. This poem I also studied in my 10th standards curriculum. I find it's relevant to today's time. It's written by B.S. Murdekar, one of legend late poet from Maharashtra. Pipant mele olya undir. Pipant mele olya undir mana padlya murgalya vil. Pipant mele olya undir mana padlya murgalya vil. Otha varti otha milale mana padlya asakti vil. Garib bichare bilant jagle. गरीब बिचारे बिरांत जगले पिपांत मेले उचकी देऊन दिवस सांडला घार्या डोली गात्रलिंग अन दोगून घेऊन जगन्या चीपन सक्ति आहे मराय चीपन सक्ति आहे जगाय चीपन सक्ति आहे मराय चीपन सक्ति आहे उदास तेला जहरी डोले काचे चेपन मधाल पोले उठा वर्थी जमले ते ही बे कलाईटी बे कलाईटी उठा वर्थी जमले ते ही बे कलाईटी बे कलाईटी उठा वर्थी ओठ लागले पिपात वंदिर नाले नाले Thank you everyone. Thank you also. Stay safe. Stay at home. Hello. I am Rajesh Swani. Artist and photographer in Udaipur, Rajasthan. 
as soon as i heard the news of lockdown and i thought like uh, at least uh, as i love nature so i thought like let's go out a little bit in countryside before i go back to the so i went down and then while i was going there i on the way i saw a medical team and uh, they had a lot of posters with them and i asked them that key what is that and then i look at them and that was the posters about updating about the corona virus and uh, how people can read that and understand that uh, what are the effect and how to take care from that so i thought like as i'm going and the people from the village they don't know uh, about this situations going on because they don't follow the news so i thought let's carry a few of these so i went there in the village in the countryside and uh, i saw some villagers so i explain them i show them the poster and i tell them let's put this out of your house and uh, so we put we put some posters outside few people's houses and then um, i explain them that key wash your hands continue and uh, when you talk to each other then please maintain the distance of more than 2 meters and uh, then the villagers they told me that key oh no what is this we don't understand that things and uh, the then i explain them that key this thing you cannot see and this thing can come and they were also curious like how this can come in their village so i told them the people who come from the city and they might say hello to you and they are infected and uh, they uh, drink water at your house and you touch the glass and then it can go all around so then they understood me the way that i explained them i also showed them some videos on my phone of the situation and how the people die so they really got <laughs> freak and then um, one of the lady she said to me the villager that ki this is all karma the people are i she know little bit so she said to me that people are eating animals and now this is all karma and this pollution everything is uh, looked by the sun and the god so now it's coming back to the reset position as she told me and she was like almost uh, 70 plus so i was like surprised the way she know a lot of things and she come to me and talk to me but yes so i went out i took some photos around and then um, i put some posters and i did my best what is possible and then i come back home as we were allowed to go and buy our everyday food from morning 7 to 12 in this lockdown time so i went to buy some food for my family and while i went out to buy some food i saw those puppies and dogs and i just say oh no i mean we can buy our food we can have but what about them and then this afternoon i was working in my studio which is just down on the main road i mean at least i have access to go in my studio and work so my shutter was half open and i saw a dog he just came and i look his face and i just say oh and then i had something to give him so i open my door and i give him some biscuits i even call him inside because i was i want to give message to people like stay home stay safe so then i got the idea like oh let's take some photos and then uh, with uh, my contacts of being a journalist like where my father is a journalist so i do the same thing with him so i had access to go out and take some photos so i used that uh, kind of contact and i went out with proper kit mask on and everything and i took some photos door to door steps i was taking photos of the empty streets i was taking photos of the present moment situations then i was taking photos of the the people on the all the rooftops like they were not allowed to be on the roads but they were allowed to be on their roof so i went on the highest roof and took some photos from there and then uh, i also took some images of the policemen who don't care for other things they were out in the street and they were doing their best to help the uh, people and to make the lockdown successful so i was thinking like how and what should i do so then i just went through the photos that i took so for example i pick up one photograph of the dog where i feed him and then i mix it with my uh, like multiple way like so i add my one of my sketches of the uh, lock so i use that one and then i add um, a street scene with that and i try to give some messages with the photos and with the art together and my all uh, message was like about stay home and stay safe because that's the only way we can save from this corona in one of my images you can see that dog is in the street and you can see in a background the whole street and he is like uh, eating something so my message was like take care of them and give them food thank you vaswa for asking us at jackfruit to talk about what is going 
what we see is happening after the coronavirus or during the coronavirus. Uh, the time during the coronavirus has been a time to do domestic work and also to um, share a complex set of questions that Zindura and I have been negotiating as members of an art world where we don't just focus on what till now was the most lucrative part, contemporary art, but looking at a diverse kind of artistic practices that there's fragilities everywhere. And we're also discussing on the ecology of art, contemporary art that we saw growing um, over the last 15, 20 years, uh, ten, last 10 years for Sindura and the last 20 years for me, where um, constantly being on the move, using materials which are entirely destructive of the environment, of health, of labor practices which are inequitable and often leave people vulnerable, um, flying everywhere are options which are um, really need to be rethought. Uh, this isn't to say that it wasn't wonderful meeting people uh, sometimes in Bangalore or in Delhi that were traveling through in their work. But the, the meetings that we treasured are with people who were spending real time and weren't flying in and out of different venues. So in that sense, uh, what we think will happen is what uh, many people in uh, uh, the humanities, arts world are saying is that there's going to be a shrinking uh, which will both have a, uh, a present an opportunity to reflect but also will cause real um, damage to a sense of um, life being something more than just survival. Uh, and I never thought that art wasn't something about human survival. I always thought that art was the way that humans survived the cruel nature of being human, right? And being a living creature. Um, so I want to just say uh, that much. And I think there's a wonderful article in the New York Times that appeared. Uh, it was written by the curator and critic J Jason Farago. Um, and and he's not the only uh, person who's saying this. He's uh, also uh, the Swiss duo Fishley and Weiss, whose airport photographs um, tell us so much about what it means to inhabit an art world, not always in neighborhoods, but as much as uh, as airport lounges. And um, this is... This is something that I am deeply, deeply find problematic. I don't think I have any trouble saying that. And I'm hoping that this will give all of us a chance to reflect, to say, do we need to fly this much everywhere? Do we need to use these kinds of re resources? Do we need to rethink what precarity means when we work with people who help us in our um practices, whether it's curatorial, art historical, or artistic practices. Certainly, we are, have been moving towards as um, institutional and market support has dwindled over the last several years with the, the shrinking of the Indian economy. Um, we've been thinking about how do we raise the kind of fees that we pay to our um, collaborators who work with us to make things happen for artists and for institutions. And I think that uh, any artist or institution, and I say artist and institution because the artists who can afford to hire people like us have more funds than, um, than uh, uh, people and institutions have more funds than many uh, people who are um, not able to hire us, uh, that it's really important to value all the supporting ecology that makes curation, criticism, 
writing, engagement, mediation, interpretation, design, um, cleaning, art handling, archiving, possible. It takes a lot of people and it takes a lot of material and it takes a lot of natural resources. Can we rethink any of these in a way that's better to each other and to the earth? Hi, my name is Satyajit Dave. I'm an art curator and an art consultant based in Mumbai. In terms of me being affected by the coronavirus, I'm not too worried uh, of me catching it because considering that I fall under the young, fairly healthy category of people and uh, the virus seems to not be as potent towards uh, the people of my age. So in terms of health-wise, I'm not really uh, worried about things, personally speaking. Uh, also, in terms of uh, how people are reacting, I mean, let's face it, it's a curveball that has been thrown thrown at us. And uh, we have to face it, we have to deal with it. I mean, there is no cure for the disease. So what at the at the most what at the least what we can do, not at the most, but at the least what we can do is that be humane towards other people. Uh, make sure that uh, we at least uh, uh, you know end up paying uh, paying the house help that is there, end up paying the various people who are a part of our lives. Uh, salaries for the next couple of uh, months in advance, if possible, and if not, at least on a month month by month basis. Uh, stay at home, try to break the chain by practicing social distancing and not to overreact. I mean, I see a lot of people overreacting about the coronavirus and it does nothing but spread a lot of uh, fear amongst people who don't really understand what the virus is and what the virus does. Professionally speaking, things are bound to be slow for the next couple of months. And either way, which ways from uh, March till August, things are always slow in the art world. The cycle that the art world follows is August to February to March. And yes, some of my upcoming shows might have to be postponed, keeping in mind the safety of people. And also since the gallery program itself will get postponed, automatically things will be pushed behind. Uh, with regards to uh, the consultation side of things, most of the work that I do, most of the consultation that I do happens in the digital space. So I'm not too worried about getting in touch with collectors and giving them a, giving them an online viewing experience as, uh, as it is called in these times. But yes, considering the lockdowns in India and the various parts of the world, logistics of the art world, artworks will get affected. And again, as I mentioned earlier, these are tough times and one has to deal with them. And uh, one has to deal with them with a certain sense of maturity and responsibility. So yeah, that's about it. That's what I feel about uh, uh, what we can do as a community. Use the online space in terms of getting in touch with people. Already a lot of galleries and a lot of museums have very, very active uh, online presence in terms of Instagram, be it in terms of YouTube channels. So I think, yeah, that's, that's the best way to go about go about things but i also feel that there would eventually be a paradigm shift or a paradigm change that would take place in terms of viewership because people will realize over the next couple of months as to how to be more effective online because uh, the more you see online uh, uh, presence the, the the online presence that you end up encountering of a lot of uh, on, on Instagram or on YouTube of a lot of these large spaces like galleries and museums, uh, there is a tendency to sort of imitate the offline online. So I think that might uh, uh, that might change. I think people will be more effective in terms of the way they can communicate online. This is Catherine Myers, and thanks, Waswell, for inviting me to be part of the series. I come to India quite often, but this occasion was a Fulbright Fellowship, which I had from January 1st to June 1st. And so it's two and a half months into that grant period, and I'm now back here in Connecticut. Uh, my Fulbright Fellowship was to teach a class in professional practices for studio artists at Banaras Hindu University, where I have two very long and very good friends who were my hosts, Pradosh Mishra, who's the department head of art history, and Suresh Nair, who's in the painting department. The thing I love the most about being in Varanasi is that I have an incredible appreciation and love of architecture. And Varanasi seems to be a place in India that maybe has changed in that sense less than other parts of India. It has this labyrinth 
old city and then the drama of the Ghats. And so you can walk on this open space and see all of the uh, many, many beautiful buildings and old palaces along the Ghats and have this feeling of openness with this river. And then you can kind of tuck in and go in these back lanes and you, it's like Alice in Wonderland. You go through all these kind of magical passageways. And as many times as I've walked through those places too, I always feel that it almost kind of reconstructs itself overnight. And I might be in a place where I've seen something that I've never seen before as many times as I've walked in those little lanes. And then more frustratingly, maybe I found something and maybe I want to go back and photograph it in a different light and I'm just never able to find it again. So Varanasi has a sense of kind of this eternalness about um, kind of Indian landscape and mythology and history. And it's something, it's a place I always want to come back to because it's in some ways it, it remains constant. So I did, I tried to establish a routine um, of going out walking every day. I loved to walk at nighttime because I liked all the little shops and the lights and the sense of the compartments that these shops were in at nighttime as well. And I was trying to create a routine of work. Certainly I was walking to the college every day. It was about a two mile walk onto that beautiful campus and back. And so I was trying to structure my time with studio time as well, which was why it was unique to have this uh, longer time period of five months in India, because I was able to kind of feel like I was really living in the way I might live here, in which I would have a certain amount of time set aside for studio time and a certain amount of time set aside to be out sort of puttering around in the garden. I was living in Varanasi in a really nice apartment um, at Asi Crossing, so it was a chance to be in one place for a long period of time. Usually on my prior trips to India, I'm always like a rolling stone and going from place to place to place. And so not only was I connected with this great institution, but also I had a chance to really live in India and get to know all the street vendors and newspaper vendors, the vegetable vendors, and to kind of go out and collect images for my own paintings and my photo series over a long period of time. And so I have this continuing series called Complementary Pink and Green in India that I started when I was in India in 2013. And what was nice about this uh, chance to be in India was that I could wait. Like there are certain places I photographed, like um, a space in Mamor Ganj, where I needed to actually wait until the sun went into the other hemisphere so it would be shining on the building and not behind the building. So that was really great that I could have patience and take my time to work on these projects slowly. Another thing that I was doing was documenting a, a kind of a controversial decision to tear down a huge swath of buildings in the old town to make a clear passage from the Golden Temple to Manikarnika Ghat. And I, you know, I've been coming to India for 20 years and I've been coming to Varanasi almost every time I come to India. So I really loved wandering through those labyrinth lanes of the old city and to see it kind of all destroyed is, and you can't continuously walk through it is really, really, really disturbing. And so I was documenting some of that process um, for myself just to keep track of what's going on, but I was finding that it was, I was going to end up in a series of paintings as well. So little by little, news of the coronavirus started to escalate, and I still wanted to remain in India, thought that I'd be able to stay in India. There was a major show of Fulbright alumni artists that I'd curated that was going to open in New Delhi on March 27th, that was 10 American Fulbright artists, and they had picked Indian artists that, that they had had continuous connections with. And so that was a really exciting event for the 70th anniversary of the Fulbright. And so I was working on, on all these different uh, projects together. And initially I thought that I could stay in India, that I could ride it out, but I think it was just becoming more and more serious more quickly. And also I think there was a perception that um, the disease was brought to India by foreigners. And so there are a few occasions where I was out walking around early in the morning because it was starting to get hot in the afternoons. And there were some comments made to me by you know, groups of young men walking by. And even one time in a kind of a small um, little village area, some sort of community elders, I walked by and I heard them saying Corona. So this was starting to make me really uneasy, even though I really kind of felt like I was part of a fabric of the neighborhood that I was living in. And I knew that people that knew me and saw me every day would not behave that way. But anytime I went away from there and was walking on the Ghats, 
I thought it could be a problem. And also certainly now there are uh, new rules about quarantine. And so um, I didn't want to put that kind of responsibility on my hosts, on Pradesh and Sarosh and my landlord, Bantu, who was really wonderful as well. I didn't want them to have to be responsible for me. But also the Fulbright Foundation, they were incredibly heroic. I mean, the, the staff at Yusefi, Adam Grotsky and um, the staff there, worked incredibly hard to find uh, flights for over 100 people so that we could leave. And my initial flight on the 23rd, I had asked for another week so I could do some video interviews before I left. That was suddenly canceled. So really, literally overnight, they had to find another flight and I had to pack up and leave really, really quickly.